Hi, my name is Yasmin Halima. I'm Vice President of the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition in New York, and I'm at the Conference for Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, which this year has been held in Montreal, Canada. And I'm very honored today to have with me Dr. Francois Clavel, who's an eminent scientist in the field of HIV virology. And Dr. Clavel is going to be sharing with us some insight, both from his work and from developments in the field of virology. Dr. Clavel, let me start by welcoming you. And thank Hi, you for yes, taking me. the time. Great to, to see you. Wonderful to Great see to you. To Thank you for taking the time out of your busy no schedule to be with us. So let's start by discussing your area of research. So you gave a, a wonderful presentation in your uh, session on Thank resistance you. today, looking specifically at a sequence of the virus, which is GAG and protease. Could you start by describing to us why that's an important area for research and where it fits into the viral life cycle? Well, it's, it's a new mechanism uh, of uh, HIV resistance to protease inhibitors. You know that protease inhibitors are very important components of, uh, of combination therapy. That's right. And there's been a lot of research of how uh, HIV could resist to these compounds and how resistance to protease inhibitor would develop over with time in patients who would fail therapy. And, and we found, uh, and, and our lab was, was particularly interested in uh, how the virus would develop a specific kind of mutations, not in the protease itself, but in the target of the protease. That is, the, the protease is an enzyme that cuts pieces of the virus mm -hmm. into uh, components that would reassemble themselves to make the mature infectious virus. These components, these proteins, are called the gag proteins. Mm -hmm. And others, and we found out, that mutations in that gag protein were uh, emerging along with increasing resistance of HIV. And we wanted to know what the role of these mutations were, was in, 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 in resistance. And we were surprised to find that these mutations that we thought had an incidental uh, sort of a side effect, nothing very strong, they had a decisive effect on resistance. So they are really uh, primary, very strong actors in the process of resistance. And that's what I showed, uh, I hope convincingly, in this talk. And I think it's a, it's a new field in research because you need to have um, to see not just the enzyme, the, the protease, the target of, in other words, you need to, find, to see the virus as a whole. Everything in a virus is being complementary to each other. The, 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 the protease acts on GAG, it acts on other, right. on other proteins, and everything is interactive between with each other in, in a virus. And that's what our results suggested. Just don't focus on a single piece of the virus. Let's look at the whole virus as a whole. Okay, let's get a little bit more specific. A lot of your presentation focused on specific areas of the GAG region. And so you talked in particular about P6, GAG domain. So are there areas like P1, P6, P2, P7 that have a special significance? No, the one we think has the most significance is what we call the nucleocapsid. Uh, P6 uh, is, is a protein that is required for the final step of assembly, and there's no mutations in the P6 region. But there are mutations that occur between uh, at the end terminus, at the, at the end of the nucleocapsid protein. Mm -hmm. And that nucleocapsid protein is an important protein because this is the one that will bind the RNA and will make the RNA a better template, a better substrate for reverse transcription. So if, you, if, if the nucleocapsid protein doesn't work well, reverse transcription doesn't work well. It's a key, it's sort of a lubricant, or a, it facilitates the process of reverse transcription. And we found that those mutations mm -hmm. that emerge along with resistance to protease inhibitors are going to make it easier for nucleocapsid to be processed by the protease so that it will work better in the context of a mutated uh, a protease. As you know, mutations in the protease always, as I said in my talk, resistance is always a compromise. Mm -hmm. You have mutations that will promote resistance, but in the same time, they will slow down, they will reduce the efficiency of uh, cleavage, of activity of the protease. And those, those mutations will ease up this, this, uh, this uh, compromise system. In addition to that, what we were surprised to find beyond this compromise story is that those mutations were decisive in resistance by themselves. And that we don't know the mechanism. This is one of the, research, the kind of research we're doing now. Why is it that those mutations have such an effect on resistance? It was not anticipated. We knew that those mutations were there. 
uh, we were surprised to find how important they were in resistance, but we don't know what the mechanism for that is. Okay, so let's try and connect with other um, areas of research that are going on, looking in the same region. So there was a poster presentations here, two of them yesterday, and they looked at, again, the GAG region, but they were two patient isolates. This is from the University College London group, sure, and Dr. That, Ravindra yeah. Gupta showed that from these two isolates that there was hyper susceptibility, a, me and a mechanism happening in GAG that explained that, and this was a response to, I think it was Kalitra, is that right? Could you explain that to us? Uh, it's difficult to explain. Uh, it, it's there, the data are there. Uh, we, we don't explain them. One of the problem is that when we create a lot of these experiments that we're doing, we're creating hybrid viruses, chimeric viruses. You take a piece of a virus and you stick it into another virus, and you end up with a virus that has a different phenotype. But is the different phenotype related to any mutation that are relevant to the treatment, or is it because the virus has a different origin or comes from a different subtype? These are th different things that are, there's a number of confounding factors there mm -hmm. that make it difficult to interpret the, the, the mechanisms that are involved in those in those findings. And, and let me ask a question about methodology. So there are assays, phenotypic assays being used to understand what might be going on. But the analysis I find interesting because it's based, for example, they look at clade C isolate sure. against a genetic comparator reference as a clade B. Now does that matter at all? When I asked the author, they said, no it didn't. What's your scientific opinion? Well, my scientific opinion, well, the, the, there's two things here. There's phenotypic assays on one side, and then the way you can use those phenotypic assays to characterize and to study uh, non-B subtypes. Um, first of all, phenotypic assays have been used, they're widely used in the U.S. They're not as much, as much used in other countries. And why is that? Uh, there has never been very strong studies showing that it was advantages for patients uh, uh, that you would get a better vision of resistance using a phenotypic assay. And I know that phenotypic assays are very popular mm -hmm. in the U.S., mm -hmm. less so in other countries. Mm -hmm. They're easy to interpret, but my feeling is that sometimes they miss the point. Mm -hmm. And there's been some studies that say that some genotypes can be more precise than phenotype. That's one point. Mm -hmm. I know that's a bit provocative, but it's I think but the conclusion that have been reached by uh, a, a certain number of studies. But yet, I know that phenotypic tests are very popular in the U.S. because they give simple results, mm -hmm. and I understand that. The other thing is that, of course, those are complex uh, systems, and you need to have a reference virus, and in the case of the phenotypic assays, which we call recombinant phenotypic assays, mm -hmm. you need to have a backbone in which you will stick different pieces of the virus. So you have a virus, a reference virus, and then you replace pieces of that virus with pieces of viruses coming from different patients. So you create, again, as I said, you create hybrid, you create chimeric viruses, mm -hmm. and then by doing so, you may create changes in virus behavior that probably have nothing to do with resistance. And sometimes could make that virus difficult to interpret. In t either in terms of, uh, of resistance or also in terms of fitness. We call fitness the ability of the virus to replicate. So some of these viruses that could be, uh, that could have, uh, if, if you take the GAG and Protease and RT from a from subtype, subtype C virus, you stick that into a subtype B, mm -hmm. you might create uh, a chimeric virus right. that does not really look like anything and that has its own properties that are neither relevant to the subtype B, neither relevant to the uh, to the subtype C virus that the GAG and protease and RT comes from. I, I think that's So that's, right. these are tricky assays. Sure, sure. But overall, they work well. Right. So, and people are mostly happy with them. Okay, no, it's very useful to but, have. But, but with the subtypes, you you raise the right point. I mean, okay. the, I mean, those, those recombinant phenotypic assays are difficult to interpret in the context of non-B subtypes, right. right. 